At the end of 1933, a new and very strange-looking bomber entered service with the Royal Air Force. This was the Handley Page Hayford, and although it looked a bit like the result of giving an airfix kit over to a group of toddlers, it was in fact a solid attempt at building a fast, reliable, modern heavy bomber. With a biplane wing layout, a top speed of 142 miles an hour, and a bomb carrying capacity of just 2,500 pounds, it would appear that the Hayford had failed to meet two of these requirements. It was neither fast, nor did it appear modern in any way. But the Hayford, like many other aircraft of its time, was a victim to the rapid pace of aircraft development. And while it was a mix mash of various design choices, in a way the aircraft equivalent of the Platypus, these choices were all made for sensible reasons. The development of the Hayford began six years earlier, with Air Ministry specification B19-27. This arose out of a dire need for a dedicated long-range nighttime bomber. Since the end of the First World War, almost a decade earlier, this class of aircraft had remained virtually unchanged in the Royal Air Force, and this was for a number of reasons. One, the Air Ministry was constantly trying to save costs. Two, unless relationships with France suddenly worsened, there was no real need for a long-range bomber. And three, there were efforts being made by members of the League of Nations to limit the development of heavy bombers, if not ban them altogether. Because of this, the most modern heavy bombers in the RAF inventory in 1927 were things like the Handley Page Hyderabad, with a top speed of just 109 miles an hour, wooden fabric construction, and a range of no better than 500 miles. Obviously, this would not do for the long term, lest the RAF fall far behind its European counterparts, and although experiments had been made on using metal structures with some bombers, such as the Handley Page Hinedi, it was accepted that the templates for RAF night bombers had to be modernised. The specification that led to the Hayford called for a twin-engine bomber that had a range of 920 miles, a military load of 3,165 pounds, including crew and defensive guns, a cruising speed of no less than 115 miles an hour at 10,000 feet, and a service ceiling of no less than 17,000 feet. Additionally, the aircraft was to provide excellent visibility for level bombing at night, positive stability for hands-off cruising when trimmed, adequate self-defence, and the ability to maintain level flight on one engine. Though reasonably modest, these requirements represented a significant upgrade for the RAF nighttime bomber force in 1927. In response to this specification, the design team at Handley Page, led by George Volkert, proposed the Handley Page HP-38. Though slightly different from the Hayford bomber that would eventually enter service, this initial design featured all of the technical innovations that made the bomber so interesting, both visually and technologically. It was the first Handley Page bomber to be built with an all-metal structure from the outset, and it featured semi-monocoque construction in its fuselage. This was used at the extreme front and rear of the fuselage, and the rest was built up from a framework of tubular steel longerons and struts that were covered in fabric. This fuselage held a crew of four. A pilot, a navigator, who also kept busy filling the roles of bomb aimer and front gunner. Then there was the wireless operator, who also doubled as the dorsal gunner. And then there was the rear gunner, who often spent their time in this, the dustbin turret. Though it had the aerodynamic properties of, well, a dustbin, it did provide excellent all-round defence for the Hayford's underbelly, an area that was often considered the weakest spot for many bombers of this period. Another weakness of many bombers of that time was speed, or rather, a lack thereof. The interesting placement of the Hayford's fuselage was part of an attempt to address this. Brute engine power could only do so much, and to improve aerodynamic performance it was realised that the upper surfaces of the Hayford's wings had to be kept clear. This resulted in two things. The wingspan was limited to 75 feet, to prevent the need for wing folding mechanisms, and the fuselage was suspended below the upper wing rather than sitting atop the lower wing. 
Now, while this did place the pilots and aircrew at a dizzying height above the ground, it did provide benefits for the ground crew. With the fuselage out of the way, the central part of the lower wing was thickened to facilitate a series of bomb cells. This, combined with the fact that the engines were mounted so high off the ground, would allow ground crews to rearm the Hayford on the ground with the engines running, which, while probably a very loud and blustery affair, was mostly safe, unless the ground crew happened to be about 10 feet tall. The prototype HB-38 took some time to complete, not being ready until mid-1930. This was not only due to its all-metal structure, which included the first Duralumin monocoque to be fitted to Hanley Page bombers, but also due to problems in wind tunnel testing. Numerous modifications had to be made to both the fixed undercarriage and the various gunner stations. The dustbin turret in particular proved to be a bit of a headache. Its mechanisms were initially prone to jamming, and there was only so much you could do to negate the effects of a giant protruding cylinder on the aerodynamics of the aircraft. When the prototype was complete, it was powered by a pair of Rolls-Royce Kestrel II engines. These produced 520 horsepower each, and drove two-blade fixed-pitch propellers, though four-blade units would later be installed. Variable pitch propellers were considered, but problems in adequately synchronising them during early tests led to them being set aside as far too complex for the time being, particularly as Hanley Page was now under considerable time pressure to get the aircraft airborne and evaluated. Its first flight took place on the 12th of June 1930, with pilot Jim Cords at the controls. His report, and that of subsequent pilots, was mostly favourable. The aircraft had effective controls, good handling across the entire speed range, and, despite the cockpit being 17 feet above the ground, it was quite easy to take off and land. There were two main points of concern. Firstly, low amplitude fin vibrations caused the throttle lever to slowly move down to the closed position, not ideal, and secondly, it was felt that the undercarriage was both too stiff and not strong enough to handle the repeated forces of landing. These later doubts were quickly proven correct when the undercarriage collapsed later on that day during taxiing. The next few months were a bit of a scramble to update the prototype in preparation for a competition against models submitted by Ferry and Vickers. Larger radiators were to be fitted to address overheating issues during sustained climbs, Various reinforcements were made to the undercarriage so that the aircraft could actually taxi and not try to imitate a field plow. The layout of the cockpit was revised, and numerous small changes were made to the airframe in general. Things were then further complicated in September, when one squadron leader Mansell inspected the prototype and passed serious remarks that there was not nearly enough space to adequately accommodate the four-man crew. The changes he recommended, which included widening the forward fuselage by 5 inches and expanding the gunner stations, could not have been achieved before the competition at Martlesham Heath was to begin. However, fate intervened, and the competing aircraft built by Vickers crashed due to a double engine failure. The competition was postponed, and modifications were made to the Hadley Page prototype to bring it up to scratch. These changes would eventually bear fruit, for numerous other delays meant that the prototype's evaluation report could not be complete until early 1932, the aircraft competition now being well over a year behind schedule. Handley Page received an anonymous but well-informed letter telling him that his bomber was the most popular of the competition, boasting superior crew comfort than its rivals. The letter also went on to comment that with the Vickers project delayed yet again, and with the ferry monoplane suffering from all kinds of stability problems, Handley Page should feel moderately confident of a production order. With this in mind, a final redesign was carried out to improve the bomber as much as possible for RAF service. This redesign not only involved changes to the monocoque, but also the tailplane, rudders, undercarriage fairings, and the engine nacelles, which had revised radiators and fuel tanks. These revisions eventually resulted in the aircraft being redesignated as the Hanley Page HP-50. It was at this point that the project almost came to a complete end. 
The League of Nations had raised the question of completely abolishing bombing, and the Air Ministry had to hold off on any new production contracts until a decision had been made. This nearly resulted in a mass layoff at Hanley Page, a company whose bread and butter was the production of bomber aircraft. But just a few months later, the situation was completely reversed by the Japanese invasion of Manchuria, and a production order for 15 Hanley Page Hayford bombers was placed in March of 1933. The prototype should have been the first to join the RAF, but after years of dutiful testing, it was destroyed during armament trials with the number 10 squadron. In truth, it was something of a miracle that the prototype had lasted this long. Previously, a pilot had landed it with only one brake applied, resulting in two and a half high-speed ground loops. Another incident involved the collapse of the starboard undercarriage, yet again, and another resulted in a shattered propeller due to spent gun casings striking the blades. Because of this loss, the first production Hayford was assembled by hand and used as a stand-in prototype, though it was structurally identical to all other production models. It made its first flight on the 21st of June 1933, and following a brief visit to Hendon, where it was displayed at the SBAC trade show, it was then sent to Mardisham Heath for its service trials. The second and subsequent Haifords would first enter service with No. 99 Squadron in Upper Hayford, which the aircraft was named after. Delivery of the bombers began on the 14th of November 1933, and the last of the first batch entered operational service the following March. Operationally, the Hayford was a big improvement on its predecessors. A novel feature was that the bombs, together with the racks, were hoisted into position as an integral unit. This was done by a special winch, in such a way that when the bomb carrier reached the mounting point, it was instantly locked in place, with no further adjustments needed other than plugging in the electric wires for the fusing and the release of the bombs. This, along with the fueling points being mounted in convenient positions on each side of the undercarriage spats, allowed rapid turnaround between sorties. In fact, it was claimed by Handley Page that turnaround between two 900-mile missions could be done in as little as half an hour, which, by any standard, is a considerable achievement. Despite its ungainly appearance, the Hayford was easy to manage and it quickly became well-liked by its crews. RAF pilots almost unanimously declared it to be viceless, and the Hayford was manoeuvrable enough that it could even be put through an aerobatic loop. This it did several times, one of which was actually during an airshow, which would have been an interesting sight for the onlookers, who might reasonably have assumed it had the handling abilities of a postbox. It wasn't long before some variants of the Hayford took over from the initial Mark I model. When a second order for 23 aircraft was placed, they incorporated several changes and were known as the Mark I-A. These changes included various weight and drag savings, and the aircraft now had the Kestrel Mark III engines, which boasted engine-driven electric generators. Many of the first 15 Hayford Mark Ones were later converted to this spec, and several aircraft also had four-blade propellers of a reduced diameter to replace the old two-blade units. Following the Mark I-A came the Mark II and the Mark III, the only major difference with these was the installation of the Rolls-Royce Kestrel Mark IV. In the Mark II, the engine was slightly downrated to 640 horsepower due to problems with cooling, but in the Mark III, they produced approximately 700 horsepower thanks to the installation of newer condenser units. This last model was the most produced, with orders totaling 70 aircraft being placed as part of the RAF's expansion plans in 1936. Considering the time period in which they operated, it will come as no surprise that the Hayfords lived a fairly quiet life, and that they weren't in service for particularly long. When they weren't doing cross-country formation flights or bombing exercises, they were often seen at various airshows. In 1934 and 1936, the Hayfords of 99 Squadron would take part in the annual RAF display at Hendon. In the latter event, they were also joined by Hayfords from 102 Squadron, who took part in dummy bombing runs and various other demonstrations. 102 Squadron would also suffer the only major loss of Hayfords during their operational service. 
Seven Haifords were en route from Northern Ireland to their base in Yorkshire when they encountered severe fog and icing conditions over Western England. Only one aircraft ended up making it to its destination. Three made forced landings, and three more crashed, either due to poor visibility or due to a loss of control as a result of ice buildup. Total casualties amounting to three killed and three wounded, and the loss or damage of several airframes, amounted to a major weather-related incident, at least for peacetime anyway. By the time that peacetime became decidedly not peacetime, it was 1939, and by this point most of the Haifords had been relegated to the training role. They had begun to be replaced as early as 1937, with the Vickers Wellington and the Armstrong Whitworth Whitleys joining the ranks of Bomber Command, but a few would actually find use during the Second World War. One Hayford was loaned for experiments in aerial refuelling, another was used to test the installation and use of various airborne radar systems, and another was used by the Royal Aircraft Establishment for testing new de-icing systems. The last Haifords weren't struck off charge until the end of 1941, which meant that, for a time, they served as amusing examples of just how quickly things had developed in the world of aviation. Supposedly, young RAF pilots more than once remarked that this so-called upside-down bomber looked like it had come from another age, except that age was a mere seven years ago. But that's how things went during the 1930s. Aircraft were modern one day, obsolete the next, and sometimes they were even obsolete before they left the factory, which is a category that the Hanley Page Hayford almost falls into. As always, thank you all so much for watching, and a big thank you of course to the patrons, whose names you'll see on the screen here. Thank you as well to Mark, who made that brilliant model of the Hayford you all just saw before, he has produced an insane number of 3D models, and I've had the privilege of being able to commission some special ones, so there's plenty more to look forward to in the future. A big thank you of course to our Wing Commander tier patrons, our highest tier members, and a warm welcome to B. Hijmering, who is the newest member of this special group. Providing nothing goes wrong, the next video will be for the topic you all voted on last month, so stay tuned for that. But as always, thank you all so much, and I'll catch you all next time. Goodbye.